All right, so this week we are talking about solutions. So what is a solution? So a solution is a homogeneous, the word homo means same, and genus is like that it's mixed. So it's a same mix all the way through. So homogeneous is all a mixture composed of two or more substances. So um, like uh, iced tea. So if you've dissolved everything in your iced tea, it kind of looks the same, it's uniform throughout, or like a Coke. So a Coke is like water and sugar and carbonation and um, caramel color and all these things, but it's mixed throughout so that your Coke like, looks the same from the top to the bottom. And so that would be a solution. So it's a mixture of two or more substances that are evenly mixed. An example of when it wouldn't be homogeneous would be like a uh, salad dressing. So when you take out your salad dressing, you got oil on the top and you got like the vinegar and whatever else is in there and you got to shake it to get it mixed up. That is not a solution because that's not homogeneous. The solute is the thing that is being dissolved. It could be a solid liquid or a gas. Um, so like in a Coke, you have, you know, liquids, uh, you have solids, like the sugar dissolved is a solid, and then you have gas, the like carbonation. And then solvents um, are the chemical doing the dissolving. So they can be liquids or gases, um, not solids. You can't like dissolve something in plastic. You have to melt the plastic first to make a liquid. All right, uh, here is a picture for you of these words. So the liquid back there is the solvent, that is the liquid. The solute in this case is a solid, it's little red things. And the whole picture together makes the solution. So in a uh, cup of tea, your solvent is the water and your solvent solute is the tea leaves or tea powder or whatever you're dissolving in there or even sugar. Uh, in a backyard pool, your solvent, again, is water. Water is also known as universal solvent. And then solute would be whatever's dissolved in the pool. So it could be chlorine, it could be acids, it could be bases, it could be whatever you need to like stabilize your pool chemistry. And then here in this fishbowl, the solvent is, again, water, and the solute um, could be anything dissolved in the water. The answer would not be the fish. The fish isn't dissolved in the water. But this fish is alive because there's oxygen dissolved in the water. And so that's an example of a gas dissolved in a liquid. There is dissolved oxygen in the water, and the fish breathes that, and it stays alive. There's also carbon dioxide, probably some salts, um, chlorine, other things that are dissolved in the water. For your blood, the um, solvent is water. Again, water is what you're mostly made out of. And inside your blood, your solutes, things that could be dissolved in there, would be like salts, would be blood sugar, um, and urea, those sort of things that you have dissolved. It wouldn't be like cells. Cells are not dissolved in the uh, solution. They're just in there, but they're not a solute because they're not actually dissolved. So what does it mean to dissolve? So in the dissolving process, all matter is made of particles, and those particles are always moving randomly. And so when a liquid particle meets a smaller particle, the liquid particle vibrates up against that solid particle and pulls that solid particle apart, like you see here in this animation. You got your blue solid particle, and then the orange particle is kind of bumping into it and breaking it apart. Here's another picture of that. So here is a chunk of salt. You've got the chlorine and the sodium, and then the water molecules are pulling it apart in salt. And it's kind of like they're taking it hostage and they're all surrounding it on each side and carrying it away. And this is causing the salt to break apart, to dissolve. And it looks like it disappears, but it doesn't. It's still in there and it's still considered a solid. When you're talking about solutions, they can be soluble. So this is something that dissolves in a solvent or they can be insoluble if it does not dissolve in a um, solvent. If you are trying to clean something out of, you know, like, you know, kid colored on the wall, it's going to be really important to know whether it is soluble in water or insoluble in water. So like, Crayola markers are supposed to be really soluble in water, but a, a Sharpie is not going to be soluble in water. And so in that case, you're going to want to use, um, you know, alcohol or acetone or some other solvent. So sometimes things are soluble in one thing, but not in the other. And pressure. So if we put a solution under pressure, you can get more gas to dissolve. This is how like the soda bubbles, you don't see them. 
until you open the lid and then you see them pop up. And that's because those soda bottles are under pressure. And so the more pressure on a solution, the more you know gas you can dissolve into that solution because gases are really susceptible to pressure. Saturation point is the point at which the solution can dissolve no more. You've put in however much you're going to dissolve, and that is it. That is the end, and the rest of it will appear as a precipitate, which is a solid and a liquid. And we'll do a lab with this. You'll do it virtually, or you'll do it in person this week, where you look for that saturation point. And so some terms you need to know is solution is just kind of the whole thing, solute plus solvent. This is a suspension, so where it's all dissolved evenly there. And then in a saturated solution, it's full. You can't hold any more. So a lot of it sits at the bottom as a precipitate. And it doesn't matter how much you stir this. If you're at a saturation point, you can't stir in any more. You can't dissolve any more. You're like, you're done. The water molecules are all busy and they can't take any more. A saturated solution contains the maximum amount of dissolved solute for a given amount of solvent at a specific temperature and pressure. So like, obviously you can change this. So if you have like ice cold water, you can dissolve a certain amount of sugar. But if you heat up your water to where it's boiling, you can dissolve way more sugar. So temperature affects how much you can dissolve as well. And so in an unsaturated solution, you're not there yet. You can you have very little solute in there. And then in a saturated solution, you're done. You can't dissolve anymore in there. And so just like what I said, unsaturated is you have less dissolved solute than the saturated solution. You're not there yet. You can still put more in an unsaturated solution. You cannot put more in a separate saturated solution. And then there are these things called super saturated solutions, which are kind of crazy. So you can make a super saturated solution. And the way you do that often has to do with manipulating temperature and pressure. And if you've ever made rock candy, you've made a super saturated solution. So you um, have put in as much as you possibly can and then you heat it up and then you put in more and then you heat it up and then you put in more and then you allow it to cool and as long as there is no what we call seed crystal in the solution it all will stay dissolved evenly it'll stay at that super saturated solution but when you add something for those crystals to grab onto then they'll start to form out of solution and this is how you make that um, rock candy all right, so here in this video, um, you may have seen this before, this makes what's called hot ice and um, it's a super saturated solution. And that's kind of cool to look at. And it's something you could do at home. Sodium acetate is something you could buy. The flask contains a super saturated solution of sodium acetate in water. A small crystal of sodium acetate will be added to the solution. So this is that seed crystal I was talking about. So they've made a super saturated solution of sodium acetate, but as long as there's nothing for the crystals to grab onto, they stay dissolved and it looks like regular solution. But the second you add what's called a seed crystal, then the crystallization process kicks off. Focus your attention on the portion of the solution to which the crystal is added. All right, so it looks like it's freezing. This is why they call it hot ice. It's not, it's not cold, but it does, it's solidifying. And so that one crystal starts kick starting that like crystallization process. So this is a super saturated solution and they're kind of cool. Um, and you can get cool crystals out of that. All right, uh, solubility curves are also something you will make this week and also learn to read this week. So what you can see is this green line. This is the saturation point. Okay, at this green line, it is um, saturated, and then um, this tells you how much you can dissolve. So if it was at uh, whatever, this is KNO3. So if I have 100 grams of water and it is 40 degrees, I can read this chart and I can say, okay, I can dissolve about 65 grams of KNO3 at 100 grams of water at 40 degrees. But notice that it goes up. So like at 70 degrees, you can put a lot more KNO3. You can put 140 grams and it goes down when it gets cold. So at zero degrees, I can put like 12 grams of KNO3 in the same amount of water. So it's dependent on temperature. Solubility curve is a graph of how much solute can dissolve based on the temperature. If you're on the green line, this is the saturation point. 
if you're above the green line. So if it was 30 degrees and you were able to put in 90 grams of solute, you are up here. So you are in the super saturated, you've made a super saturated solution. And then if you're below the line, so if it's 30 degrees and you've added 10 grams, then you're still below that line. And so you're still in the unsaturated solution kind of territory and you can still add more. For most solutes, as the temperature goes up, the solubility goes up. So you're going to see a curve that points upward like this for most, not everything, but most things are as the temperature gets warmer, the more you can dissolve. And then when you're talking about two liquids, so there are miscible liquids, and this is when you take two liquids and they're not soluble in each other. And you may have seen this before with like oil and water, you know, oil and water doesn't mix. When there's an oil spill, it's kind of handy because the oil floats to the top. And then we can kind of clean up that, that oil that spilled because the oil floats on water and they don't mix. And so those are immiscible. But if it's two liquids that are soluble in each other, so example, you can put vinegar and water, no problem. You can put, um, uh, alcohol and water and they mix no problem and so those would be miscible so this is for liquids that can make solutions and not make solutions it's different than dissolving uh, molarity so finishing off these notes here with the concept of molarity molarity is the most widely used unit for concentration when preparing solutions in chemistry and biology and so when i make solutions i have to measure their molarity um, when I am making those solutions. And so, you know, we go to the chemical supply room and we're looking for a certain molarity. So I have to make, you know, one molar, one molar or five molar and the more the molarity is, the more concentrated the solution is. So often in high school chemistry, I stick to really low molarity solutions because they're less dangerous. They have less chemical, um, and more water. And so molarity is the number of moles of solute dissolved in one liter of solution. And this is just how we make solutions. So molarity is a calculation you're going to have to do, but it's it's part of a calculation you've already done. So it's kind of a review for the moles part, and then the liters part is pretty easy. So the units for molarity are moles over liters. It's abbreviated as M, and the formula is moles of solute over liters of solution. The problem is that you're not often given moles. You're often given grams, and then you've got to convert. But this again, this is math you've done before, so it shouldn't be too crazy. So a molarity example problem. If I have 10 grams of NaOH and I dissolve it in enough water to make two liters of solution, what's the molarity? So step one is to convert the grams of solute because it says 10 grams of NaOH and in molarity, it's moles over liters. So grams is nowhere in that. So I need to turn this grams into moles. So convert grams of substance into moles. And you've done this before. So you start by writing what you have. You draw your division bar. And then you put your molar mass, this comes from the periodic table on the bottom, and then you put one mole of NaOH on the top. And then, um, so again, this is the molar mass, comes from the periodic table, Na plus O plus H. And then this is always one on top, and then you solve. So 0 0.25 moles of NaOH is 10 grams um, of NaOH, 0 0.25 mole. Then once I have the moles, I divide the moles by liters. That's pretty easy. So 0 0.25 moles, this is what we just like solved for in step one. And this two liters was given to us in the question. And so then we just use our calculator and we solve. So that we're making a 0 0.125 molar NaOH solution if we put 0 0.25 moles in two liters of solution. So you'll have some practice with molarity this week. Um, if you're not coming in person, you'll do a worksheet. And if you are coming in person, you will actually make some Kool-Aid and we'll make different molarities of Kool-Aid and you get to taste it and see like, what's your favorite molarity of Kool-Aid?